Welcome to this episode of Zoom with ZOA, update from Israel, title of which is Understanding the Shimon Hatzadik Rental and Eviction Dispute, featuring Israeli law professor Avi Bell. Uh, Mr. Bell will be introduced by ZOA President Mark Klein, and Q&A will be moderated by ZOA representative in Israel, Dan Elunis. I'm Alan Jay, ZOA Director of Outreach and Engagement. During the webinar, I'll put my address in the chat. If you want to get in touch and find more information for ZOA, don't hesitate to let me know or reach out to me. To ensure the best program quality, please keep your microphones muted for the duration of the program. There will be Q&A at the end of the program. It will be moderated by Dan Aluz, Israel's ZOA representative. Dan has formerly worked for the Likud and for Naftali Bennett and Bibi Netanyahu. He is a former city council member of Jerusalem, and uh, you will hear more from Dan when he's monitoring and moderating the Q&A. Mort Klein has been national president of the Zionist Organization of America for more than 25 years, and is one of the leading Jewish activists in the United States today. Mort is a child of Holocaust survivors born in a displaced persons camp in Gunsberg, Germany. With Mort's diverse background, having worked in Washington, D.C. as an economist in three U.S. administrations and working as a biostatistician with two-time Nobel laureate Linus Pauling, Mort adds unique dimension to his most fearless and outspoken Zionism and Jewish activism. Mort has testified before Congress, is often quoted in the media, and has appeared on any number of television and radio outlets. The Jewish people are blessed and ZOA is honored to work with one of the preeminent Zionists of our time to introduce our speaker, ZOA National President, Mort Klein. Well, thank you, Alan, for that uh, extraordinarily generous uh, introduction. Uh, I should have stayed in medical research when I was in it because when I was doing medical research with uh, Professor Pauling, I only got praise for my work. Now, I get criticized every now and then. Uh, it's my extreme privilege uh, to introduce our renowned guest, Professor Avi Bell. I've known Avi Bell for decades. I first met him, I believe, when uh, he and Aaron Friedman invited me to speak at the Harvard Jewish Law Students uh, Group, uh, where Avi was a student at the time. Uh, in our conversation after that talk, uh, he, Avi Bell impressed me with his knowledge of the Arab War Against Israel, with his insightful and extraordinarily thoughtful intellect. Uh, he's a professor at bar -Lan University Law School at the University of San Diego Law School. Uh, he specializes in land use and property law and other uh, legal matters, which makes him extraordinarily well qualified for today's topic. Uh, and by the way, you should know, I believe it's correct. He's also one of Prime Minister Netanyahu's uh, attorneys, which shows uh, the, re the respect and esteem uh, that people uh, have for Professor uh, Avi Bell. There's really no one more qualified to speak on today's issue, uh, the issue surrounding Shimon Hatzadik. Uh, and it's uh, a pleasure and an honor for Avi Bell to be with the ZOA this morning. Thank you, Professor Bell. Uh, thank you. I'm very honored to be here. And thank you, all of you, uh, uh, for joining us. Um, I, I trust you don't hear it, but uh, I am at home right now in Jerusalem. Um, Behind us, um, you can see the last of the uh, sunlight. So at some point during our session, the backlighting will go away and uh, the sun will set. Um, also, because uh, we're at home, uh, um, uh, my 10-month-old is now going to sleep and he's protesting loudly. I hear it. I'm not sure that you do. I think that the, uh, the microphone is uh, successfully um, masking the sound. Okay, so um, I'm going to... Uh, try to speak very briefly actually about the topic. I think it'll, it will be more interesting if I address the concerns that you have. So I'm gonna give a, a very brief overview of the uh, controversy surrounding uh, Sheikh Jarrah or Shimon Tzadik. Um, 
and uh, then uh, you know Dan can run the questions, uh, and I'll do my very best to to get to everything. Okay, so um, the the controversy in um, and Mord, you'll have to excuse me. I'll, I'm going to call the neighborhood uh, Sheikh Jarrah. That's uh, um, the the name in Arabic for the for the uh, uh, neighborhood, and I'll explain how that came about in a moment. But the, the controversy in Sheikh Jarrah concerns a little over two dozen uh, pieces of property, about uh, 28 uh, pieces of property that were purchased in the late 19th century by, uh, by Jews. Um, because of Ottoman land law at the time, they were not purchased by individual Jews, they were purchased by the Jewish community. And so um, uh, ownership uh, was registered in the names of the chief Sephardic and chief Ashkenazi rabbi of the time. And uh, they put it in, in the names of two land trusts that they held. Um, if you're interested in um, um, Ottoman land law, the reason for this, besides the fact that it's very difficult for Jews to have bought land under any circumstances in, in Ottoman law is that there was very little private ownership of land and more or less the only way to get close to it was to put it in a religious land trust, something that's called a waqf, um, which you may have heard about in other contexts. At any rate, uh, there, were, there were two Jewish waqfs, right? The, uh, the Ashkenazi and the Sephardi in, uh, uh, in, um, in Israel um, and they bought um, two different pieces of land um, in an area north of the old city that was um, only beginning to be populated. Um, the, they found it out of these two pieces of land, two neighborhoods. One was called Shimon Atzadik and the other one was called Nachalat Shimon. Um, the names Shimon Atzadik means uh, Simon the Righteous, Nachalat Shimon means um, the inheritance of Simon, and both were named after a famous tomb, the tomb of Simon the Righteous, um, which is located right near those two pieces of property. Now, there's another famous tomb there, um, the, the tomb of Sheikh Jarrah, um, and um, there was therefore a third neighborhood that was founded there, uh, an Arab neighborhood called Sheikh Jarrah, and um, these three neighborhoods were side by side until um, the Israeli War of Independence, that, until, that is until 1948. Now, it wasn't all peaceful in the, in the, uh, during that uh, period. Um, um, as you are probably aware, during the first half of the 20th century, before there was a state of Israel, there was a lot of intercommunal violence. Um, and uh, periodically, uh, the local Arab population um, attacked Jewish neighborhoods not only in Jerusalem, but elsewhere in Israel and Hebron, most famously, um, there uh, a lot of the families in Sheikh Jarrah or in Shimon et Sadek and Nachalat Shimon were driven out of their homes uh, temporarily by, um, by riots at various points, um, but they then returned. The communities were there up until 1948. In 1948, uh, of course, um, uh, the uh, formal Israeli War of Independence uh, began, fighting actually began in, no, <clears throat> excuse me, in, in uh, November of 1947. But uh, um, by mid-1948, the Transjordanian army had conquered uh, the majority of the, the new city of Jerusalem and um, um, the old city of Jerusalem. And they expelled the, all of the Jewish communities in the areas that they conquered, uh, meaning that they seized a lot of land. Among the lands that they seized were all the lands owned by the two uh, Jewish trusts, the two Jewish land trusts in Shimon Atzadik and Nachalat Shimon. The Jordanians then um, uh, proceeded to eliminate these two Jewish neighborhoods. They simply combined them with a larger, the, the larger neighborhood of Sheikh Jarrah. Um, and since then, we've called the entirety, the, the, the combined three neighborhoods, Sheikh Jarrah. And as for the property, um, the, the Jordanians seized it, they sequestered it and placed it under the uh, custody of the Jordanian custodian, 
for enemy property. Enemy property meaning um, property of persons in the enemy state of Israel, or in as the courts interpret it, basically property of Jews. Um, the 28 uh, um, uh, uh, houses that are currently being uh, litigated in various forums, uh, in various courts, uh, are all from um, the sequestered properties by the Jordanian custodian. Now, these are far from the only sequestered properties. The Jordanians took a vast amount of, uh, of Jewish land in um, what the parts of Jerusalem that they conquered, and of course, elsewhere in uh, Judea and Samaria, el elsewhere in what they called the West Bank. Um, most of this property was uh, uh, transferred to other government actors or to private uh, uh, Jordanians, and uh, that is the end of that. However, these 28 properties were held onto by the Jordanian custodian. That is, it, they, the Jordanian custodian sequestered them, but never transferred title to anyone else. Um, instead, during the 1950s, um, the Jordanian custodian uh, signed a deal with the uh, UN Re Relief and Works Agency uh, to build temporary housing for uh, Palestinian refugees and to rent to those refugees um, uh, residential units within those 28 properties. And lease agreements were signed with, uh, with those individuals. Um, according to uh, the Palestinians, and apparently this is correct, the Jordanians promised to uh, eventually sell them uh, title to the property. The Jordanians, however, never did so. I don't know why there's there's no record of any follow up either by the uh, Palestinians or by the Jordanian government or frankly by uh, the UN uh, Relief and Works Agencies. They remain tenants until um, 1967. In 1967, of course, uh, Israel terminated the Jordanian occupation of uh, parts of Jerusalem. And uh, the property that was sequestered by the Jordanian custodian for enemy property fell into the hands of um, an Israeli receiver. Now, uh, the Knesset was looking at this. You know, here you have uh, the Israeli receiver is holding property um, that was sequestered from the enemy, Israel. Right? That's a little bit bizarre. And so uh, the Knesset passed a law in 1970 uh, um, ordering the receiver to end the sequestration of property that was still held by the receiver. If the property, if title had been transferred, then you know, title ended up wherever title ended up. Um, Israel is not gonna unwind every transaction um, that Jordan did during its uh, 20 years or 19 years of occupation. But where the, the custodian still held onto property um, and it passed to the hands of the receiver, the receiver released the property back to the registered owners. What that meant for these 28 properties was that uh, ownership was released back uh, to the uh, two land trusts, the two Jewish land trusts that were able easily to prove ownership because their deeds were registered since 1875 and 1876 in the uh, Ottoman registries. And um, in 1972, the land trusts uh, registered in the Israeli registry their ownership. This is when all the lawsuits started. Um, the first thing, of course, the land trust tried to do was to uh, take possession of their property. Um, but uh, um, on these 28 properties, in some of them, there were leaseholders that had gotten leases from the Jordanian custodian. On others, there were just people who had squatted on the property. Um, there was a round of litigation that lasted roughly 10 years and eventually um, most of the uh, cases ended with a, um, a settlement in which um, uh, the owners agreed not to look too much into whether there were proper lease agreements or not. They basically recognized the, the lease rights of all the residents there. And in exchange, the residents recognized the ownership of the owners. And um, the, the um, leaseholders were given what's called under Israeli uh, law of protected tenancy, which meant more or less as long as they lived up to their, their uh, lease obligations and paid rent, <clears throat> they could never be evicted for the, all of their lives. 
And if their children lived with them, then the next generation, all of their lives could continue as long as they paid rent and lived up to lease obligations, which uh, is the kind of thing should, should have put this uh, uh, issue to sleep for the next uh, uh, 40 years. Instead, um, what happened was uh, two things. First of all, the uh, Palestinian tenants and, um, and leaseholders, after a short amount of time, began trying to uh, went, go, going, went back to court to try to attack the settlement agreement that they'd reached. They weren't terribly successful, but there were dozens of lawsuits in which they, they tried var in various ways to um, argue that the um, settlement should be uh, nullified, the court rulings based on that settlement should be nullified, uh, et cetera. And then uh, eventually, after none of the, le the, the leaseholders paid uh, uh, rent, after every one of them <laughs> was in breach of the lease agreements, after um, new people entered in the property with, as squatters and had no rights whatsoever, um, the, uh, the, the landowners started suing for evictions. Now, in the meantime, the landowners, the two land trusts had sold ownership to a company called, uh, called uh, Nahalat Shimon, um, which you can tell by the name is, is named in honor of one of the two destroyed neighborhoods. Um, and you can tell is obviously under Jewish ownership. Um, and um, Nahalat Shimon has been prosecuting the eviction suits for years. Um, it re this reached the headlines uh, several months ago um, after um, one round of litigation with uh, um, four regarding four of these properties. Um, the, um, the owners, Nahalat Shimon, the, the company, had um, won an eviction order from the magistrate's court, from the trial court. Um, the, um, the squatters and tenants uh, appealed to the Jerusalem District Court. The Jerusalem District Court upheld the eviction orders. Um, and then the, uh, um, the squatters and tenants uh, asked for leave to appeal again to the Israeli Supreme Court. This would be the last appeal. That appeal is not, that request for leave for appeal has not yet been heard, but in anticipation of the court date, there were riots in Sheikh Jarrah and a host of inaccurate uh, uh, reports describing this as some Israeli government plot to engage in ethnic cleansing or to evict Palestinians from the neighborhood. All of these are just complete lies from top to bottom. Uh, the only thing that is going on there is private owners are um, engaging in 50 years of litigation to recover possession of the land that they own, of land that they and their predecessors in title have owned for 150 years. Um, and the only reason that we're seeing international controversy about this is because um, in this very standard private eviction suit between on the one side an owner and on the other side, a breaching tenant or a squatter, um, it happens that the owner is Jewish and um, the um, tenants in breach and the squatters are Palestinian Arabs. And therefore, you hear all these uh, ridiculous stories about ethnic cleansing and the like. One of the more, most popular lies, and with this I'll close and then I'll, I'll ask Dan to, to uh, put to me any questions there are. One of the most ridiculous things that uh, uh, you'll, you'll see and read, um, I think I counted it in within the space of two weeks, um, this lie repeated in stories by Patrick Kingsley of the uh, New York Times, uh, no less than four times. Uh, um, and of course, he's not the only one uh, propagating this lie, but the, 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 it's often described as there's uh, the real source of controversy is that allegedly Israeli law allows um, Jewish landowners to reclaim possession of sequestered property, but not Arab landowners. Now, that's a complete lie. You can read the law. The law does not talk at all about the ethnicity of any owners. 
It doesn't give Jewish rights any, rec any Jews any rights to reclaim. It does not deny Arabs any rights to, to reclaim. Uh, the particular law that Israel passed in 1970 was for a one-time release of property that had been sequestered by the Jordanian custodian of whatever ethnicity, however it got to that person. It was released then, 50 years ago, and that's it. There are no claims now that are being raised by anyone uh, to reclaim old properties from the government on the basis of their ethnicity. There, there weren't 50 years ago, and there aren't today. What's going on right now are private lawsuits between owners who have had, who have had their ownership confirmed by registration and by courts for, for decades, pursuing uh, uh, their legal right to regain possession of land that they own and being dragged through the courts for 30, 40 years in order to regain that possession. That's what's going on. And the idea that somehow or another Israel is obliged to discriminate against Jewish owners in order to um, uh, assuage the, 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 the world opinion that Jews cannot have land rights is simply appalling. Okay, Dan, uh, that's my two, two cents and uh, uh, pose the questions. Thank you so much, Avi. Uh, it, was, uh, it was incredible. It was very clear, organized, and you took a very complicated subject and made, me, made it very understandable. Uh, we'll get now to a questions and answer. I invite uh, everyone to write questions uh, in the chat or in the Q&A section. Uh, but first, I'd like to invite uh, Mort, uh, our national president, if you'd, if you'd like to ask a first question. Uh, thank you, Avi. Uh, uh, extraordinary clear, as you always are. Uh, I really want to ask you a question. It's not a legal question. How do you explain people at the New York Times and elsewhere <clears throat> outright lying without researching the truth or not caring about the truth? How do you explain, in your opinion, as, as an Israeli Jew and, and a lawyer, that Anthony Blinken, the Secretary of State, Secretary, uh, Senator Warren, Senator Sanders, have publicly state proclaimed that Israel dare not evict these people even though the courts say they have every right to because these people are simply people who haven't paid rent. And, and if they were Jews, they would be evicted as any country in the world would allow eviction to tenants who are, not, who are breaching the contract and not paying rent. And yet Warren Sanders Blinken has publicly stated that Israel should ignore the courts and allow these Arabs to live there. It's mind boggling. What, what are your thoughts as to wh why is this happening? Why would they ignore the law, why would they ignore the truth? Why would the New York Times just lie and lie and lie? I mean, it's a general question about everything concerning the Arab war against Israel. But here I found it especially extraordinary when you have uh, American officials telling Israel, do not fulfill the proclamations of your own courts. How do you explain this? So I, I would actually um, divide this uh, group of non, uh, th those who refuse to accept the truth into two groups. Okay, there's, um, there's one group, um, I would prefer not to mention his name, but I was in touch with uh, um, an editor of a paper who had written, included one of these lines saying something about, you know, the, the under Israeli law, Jews can reclaim uh, uh, sequestered property and, and Palestinians cannot. And I, I, told me you're wrong. I sent him documentation. I showed him the relevant uh, sections of the law. And he said, well, that's not the way we understand it. I, you know, what do you mean that's not the way we understand it? <laughs> it's in black and white. This is not a question of interpretation, right? I, you look at the law, it doesn't say anything about Jews having a right to claim property. It doesn't say anything about denying Palestinians a right to reclaim property. There's no issue of interpretation here, but it, that was it. He just, you know, he said, now, why, why was he refusing to uh, um, accept the, um, the truth? And I think the answer is that uh, the editor of this paper, I think that this is the same as true of Patrick Kingsley, Kingsley and uh, of the New York Times, um, 
they have a certain endorsed truth that is an endorsed narrative of the facts that supports their political opinions. And they're just not willing to publish uh, something that um, disturbs that narrative unless they're forced to. And forced to would be if somebody that they consider to be on the right side of things politically would say so. So if, let's say, Elizabeth Warren were to admit, you know, Avi Bell is right, then the New York Times would publish it. But until then, they're not going to. Okay, that's group one. They just they know better. They're lying about it. They're lying for political reasons. And then I think there are are, are people, and I don't know who's in this group. Um, I suspect that Blinken's in this group, but maybe I'm giving too much credit. They just they don't know better. That is, they read the New York Times and they think they're reading an honest evaluation of the facts, even though it's it's a lie. And the authors uh, uh, in the New York Times know it's a lie. They so they they have this idea that they're they're reading the truth. Um, I'm not among their trusted supporters. They have no reason to listen to me. I don't know if anybody's put in front of their faces. Um, uh, the information that I'm giving them. Now, I, I have briefed um, the uh, personnel in the American embassy. Um, so it's in the reports somewhere, but that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, people like Blinken have ever bothered to, ta to take a look. So it, it may be uh, that some of them actually don't know that they're lying even though they are lying. Uh, of course, it, it, it amounts to the same thing because they're just ne never going to accept the truth unless it comes from uh, their political allies. And because uh, somebody is, anybody who's pro-Jew, pro-Israel in this is considered not to be an ally, they're just never gonna listen to the truth. Thank you, Avi. The next question uh, I'll ask, uh, is from uh, Susan Tuckman, uh, the director of the ZOA Center for Law and Justice. She asked if you can uh, speak about what is the basis of the tenants and squatters appeal. Uh, <laughs> okay, so there's uh, um, a variety of different arguments and none of them are very good. <laughs> um, so um, some of them are that um, they're not bound by the earlier rulings, um, the earlier court rulings, uh, particularly the court ruling in 1982 that uh, of ownership by um, the Jewish land trusts because um, they weren't parties uh, to the settlement. But some of them were, some of them were not. Um, and therefore, um, um, the court ruling that of, of ownership by the land trust doesn't apply to them. But their predecessors in title were part of those lawsuits. Um, there's no reason to challenge the, uh, um, uh, the earlier ruling. Um, the Jewish land trust ownership was registered 50 years ago, well, 49 years ago. Um, and they don't have any challenge of that registration. And so it's, it's hard to see um, uh, um, what they think they're going to get out of that one. Then they have various claims of unspecified fraud. There was, they were defrauded somehow by someone somewhere along the way. And they, if they agreed to the settlement, they didn't mean to agree to the settlement or they didn't understand the settlement or the, they, they didn't understand that they should have objected to the registration 49 years ago, or they, the, the, um, um, they got ownership because the Jordanians promised them ownership. And so that promise to eventually transfer title really gave them title, right? Um, a variety of you know, bizarre arguments. Um, and then the most bizarre argument of all is um, um, it, two of the uh, uh, litigants came in with a document saying, we can show we obtained title. We um, have a deed that we received in the 1990s from somebody named Ismail. Right now, why is Ismail the former owner of this property? That they've got no answer for. Right? Why would we think that this deed uh, gives them any title or even applies to this land? No answer. But they have a deed. Right. Um, now, what's most interesting is that of all the claims they make, the the best and strongest one, the one that would leave them in possession, is the one they don't raise. Um, under Israel's protected tenancy law, um, a tenant who is in breach, who is repeatedly in breach, 
and against whom um, the landlord is entitled to an eviction order, nevertheless has the right at any stage of the legal proceeding to request um, what is called uh, um, uh, basically equitable relief or, or relief in the interests of justice. And basically, they, uh, I, I've, I've handled cases like this that basically amounts to the, the tenant who has never paid rent comes to court and says, yeah, but I was sick, but the dog ate my homework. You know, I, um, um, I, was, uh, I was in a bad mood, but I promise to do better in the future. And in 99 out of 100 cases, the court will give them the relief they ask for. They'll cancel the eviction order and the tenants will stay on. If the tenants had done this in this case, at any stage, they can still do it, by the way, um, they would have the ability to stay on in the land until the expiration of the, the, to the tenancy. They just don't want to. And the reason they don't want to is because this is not really a legal argument for them. They, they know they've got no case. What this is about is a refusal to accept the legitimacy of Jews own, owning property. That's what it's really about. And so they're not going to engage in any argument that, entail, that in, in, entails recognizing Jewish ownership. Thank you. Uh, the next question, first of all, I'll, I'll uh, say that Jeffrey Cranes asked if there's an article that summarizes your arguments. And so we posted in the chat the article that you wrote for the JNS, which was a great article. I, I wrote uh, two. I wrote two. Uh, if if, you, if you, you found one, then send the other one or I'll, I'll send you guys both. OK, so I'll look uh, for the other one while you're answering the next question. Uh, the, the, the next question will be from Greta Rafsky. She's asking, why is the Supreme Court reluctant to pass a judgment? Uh, what is the government prepared to do if the judgment goes in favor of legal owners and Arabs decide to riot? Two different questions. Yeah, okay, so um, let's start with the first one. Is the uh, Israeli Supreme Court reluctant to issue a judgment? Uh, actually, I don't think so. Right? Uh, the um, um, the courts are overburdened in Israel. Uh, all litigation takes a long time. Um, this particular round of litigation is taking about five years. That's not insane by Israeli terms to go through three levels of court. Um, the, um, the request for leave to appeal in the Supreme Court was properly calendared. Um, the hearing was postponed at the last minute because the Attorney General, Avichai uh, Menblit, um, asked the court for leave to intervene, um, and uh, they granted him leave to intervene. Um, and then he withdrew his request. He said he's not going to intervene after all. That was clearly um, an attempt to um, intervene for political reasons, that it, to, to stop the riots or get the riots uh, uh, postponed to another date. When uh, there wasn't, uh, uh, when there weren't rockets landing in Israeli cities, um, but um, uh, that's the only reason there was a delay in the court hearing was because the attorney general asked for leave to uh, intervene and then dropped that request. Now we're going into you know the end of the summer. the The court will be in uh, recess, and then it'll eventually get calendar at some point uh, um, in the fall or winter. Oh, this. What was the second question? What will the government do? The, the, yeah. Yeah, so um, um, you know, <laughs> there, there's a, a very famous uh, saying in the Talmud that um, uh, since the, uh, the destruction of the second temple, prophecy is the realm of, of fools. So I'm going to try to avoid being a fool <laughs> and not prophesy. Um, the, um, I think that... Um, there is a reasonable chance of rioting in Sheikh Jarrah um, should the court uh, deny the leave to appeal. Um, I think that, that the overwhelmingly likely outcome um, of, of the hearing, because simply put, the, the, the litigants, right, the, the, the tenants in the squatters case has um, no legal merit that I can discern. Um, so it, uh, it's very hard to see how the Supreme Court would issue a judgment in their favor. Um, uh, so I think that the, likely we will see the eviction orders uh, upheld and um, 
there will be riots. How serious those riots will be will depend, I think, on the political environment internationally rather than uh, locally. That is, um, the reason to riot is because it uh, um, wins applause in certain uh, places in, um, in Europe and in uh, uh, the east and west coasts of the United States. Um, and uh, that is likely to be there no matter what. That is, the, the support for uh, rioting over uh, Sheikh Jarrah is going to is going to be there. Um, by by the way, riots have not stopped in the meantime, right? They're just there 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 uh, there is uh, violence and unrest in in Sheikh Jarrah now. Um, but um, um, I don't know. I don't know what the uh, um, what the uh, uh, government will do. The government could order the police not to serve um, the eviction orders, or it could order them not to uh, protect the owners when they try to take possession of their land in pursuant to the owners, or it might back them up. And I, I really don't know. Um, this is a very, very funny government, as you know. It's comprised of eight different parties of uh, very, very different um, uh, ideological persuasions. I really have no idea how it's going to handle any issue like this. Thank you. Uh, the next question is uh, from Liz Burney, uh, ZOA Director of Special Projects. She asks, uh, did the Palestinian Authority prevent the tenants from paying rent or are they otherwise involved? And who else is involved, NGOs, etc.? We got a similar question from Sylvain Hayoun about the Jordanians, uh, and are they also involved in, in the current uh, dispute? Well, um, the, the Jordanians, uh, the Palestinian Authority, uh, the European Union, um, uh, various European states have all encouraged um, the uh, Palestinians to uh, litigate and not to uh, give up the property. They've all expressed the opinion that international law requires Israel to discriminate against Jewish landowners and that it's a violation of international law to um, recognize property rights that belong to Jews in um, what they call East Jerusalem. Um, so that I know to be the case. Now, is it, were there orders not to pay rent? That I haven't seen documented anywhere. It wouldn't surprise me. Um, but on the other hand, there's no particular uh, uh, piece of evidence that I've seen to suggest that that's the case. Um, um, and I don't know whether um, the, um, the tenants and the squatters have received funding for staying there. I do know that um, their, um, their legal battles are all being subsidized. That is, uh, they're not paying their legal expenses. Okay. There's a question which is similar to one that you already answered, but I'll ask it anyways, because I think it's, it's important. Uh, even uh, Gerald Levine asks, uh, even under the New York City rent control system, it does not take decades to remove non-paying tenants. So he asks, has, has it taken this long in Israel because the courts are bend, bending over backwards to appear fair to the Arabs? Seems like you answered that that's not the reason. So, it, so what is the reason it's taking so long? Um, protected tenancy laws are pretty awful. Okay, um, so or let me put it this way: protected. If you think that the New York City rent control laws are very uh, pro-tenant, anti-landlord, you have to read uh, Israel's protected tenancy laws. Um, as I as I said, the protected tenancy laws more or less give the the tenant the right at any stage, at any point along the, the line, after having paid no rent and fulfilled none of the obligations of the lease and violated in every way possible to come into court and say the dog ate my homework and to get the eviction canceled. Um, um, I know that I handled uh, for um, uh, some cousins a uh, protected ten tenancy case against uh, um, a, a tenant who had not paid rent for decades. Um, and I was unable to get an eviction order because he came into court and uh, said the dog ate my homework, right? And that was enough. The court said, well, well equitable relief, no eviction. So um, in this case, um, 
the the owners have tried to postpone filing for evictions until the case was unassailable, right? Where they could prove not only that they they, you know, they weren't uh, paying rent, but where they could prove that they're already the third generation, right? Protected tenancy only goes first generation, maybe the second generation. Third generation clearly doesn't apply or that they're squatters. They're not even related to the original tenants. And so the, uh, there's this long period of waiting um, before filing any of these lawsuits. Um, and it's because of that, that the, the outcome, is, at least legally is so obvious, right? They, these are not cases where um, any, reasonable court should rule against the landlords. We have another question from Liz Burney, again, is the OA Director of Special Projects. Uh, you mentioned that the current litigation involves four properties. Uh, what is the current status of the other 24 properties? So um, there have been uh, already uh, eviction orders in some of the, them. I don't know the number. And um, there are other lawsuits that are in lower levels that have already been filed, and eventually the rest of them will be filed as well. It's, it's, each, each one depends on the point where the owners have a clear enough case that no reasonable court will ever deny them an eviction order. Right? So um, we're in the middle of a series of cases. These are going to come out, you know, not, not four properties and then 24. There's a handful that are already completed. Uh, there's these four. I think there are another eight that are rattling around the court system right now. And then there'll be you know, uh, uh, several more cases. Thank you. Uh, there's one last question uh, from the chat and then I'd be happy to uh, invite Mort to ask one final question. So uh, from the chat, uh, it, you're being asked if this represents the whole Israeli-Palestinian conflict in a nutshell, as Islam does not recognize the legal right of Israel to be where it is. Um, I, okay, it, Islam is a, a religion that is, um, uh, that has more than a billion followers. There are a number of different versions of, of Islam and many different Islamic beliefs. I don't think that uh, um, I would summarize the, um, the Arab-Israeli conflict as about a particular interpretation of Islam. I think that the Arab-Israeli conflict has always been about um, a question, a central question of will, um, will Arabs accept the legitimacy of a Jewish state on the ancient Jewish homeland. Um, there has always been a very small minority of uh, Arabs who have accepted its legitimacy. And um, sadly, a very large majority that have not. Um, the large majority of Arabs that have not, have not been solely um, Muslims. They've also been Christians. Um, and so I, I I don't think that that summary is correct. Um, I'll also say that uh, um, I don't think that that is what's at issue in, uh, in this case, right? Sheikh Jarrah is uh, a battle about the legitimacy, not of the existence of a Jewish state. It's about a much more basic question. It's about whether individual Jews have a right to exercise their property rights. Now, what you're seeing, and this is not about the Arab-Israeli conflict, this is about, um, I think this is a, a better, a summary of European support for the Palestinian cause as they understand it. Um, the way they understand the Palestinian cause it is a sort of a, a free-floating license to discriminate against Jews in the name of claims of justice or international law. And that's what's going on in Sheikh Jarrah. You have international demands that Israel uh, discriminate against Jews in the exercise of their property rights, engage in land discrimination against Jews in order to fulfill these imaginary doctrines, imaginary imperatives um, um, that, that, as they understand it, that, that uh, international law forbids Jews to own land or to acquire land or Jews to have equal rights as individuals. 
right? Um, and um, it, it's asking Israel to knuckle under this entire um, narrative of lies um, that's, that's fabricated around the bigotry in order to explain why anti-Semitism is not anti-Semitism, it's actually adherence to principle. Right. It's it's a, a summary not of the Arab-Israeli conflict. I think it's a summary of the of the sickness of of Western and particular European support for the Palestinian cause that is nothing more than a fig leaf for anti-Semitism. Thank you, uh, Mort. Do you want to ask the last question? Yes. Thank you, uh, Avi. Uh, your lucid and compelling presentation makes it clear that if I ever needed a lawyer in Israel, I would do what <laughs> Prime Minister Netanyahu did. I would hire you. Thank uh, you. First of all, I, I, I strongly recommend that none of us use the phrase Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, Israel has tried to resolve this generously a dozen or more times. I would always refer to it as the Arab war against Israel. I think that's more uh, accurate. Uh, I would ask you, who do you know who is paying for the for these Arab uh, lawsuits against uh, the Jews? Uh, are the riots spontaneous or are they organized? And why hasn't any Israeli official published uh, op-eds in major American papers explaining what you just explained? I haven't seen a single op-ed from an Israeli official. They'd almost be forced to allow that publication. Uh, to defend Israel and make it clear that uh, how nonsensical all, all this is. So those are my three quick questions. Who's paying the riots? Why is no Israeli official published an op-ed? Okay, so I, I can't tell you um, who's paying because I, I don't know. As I, 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 I've, I've, uh, I've met the lawyer uh, who's handling these four cases. Um, he hasn't told me who's paying his bills. Um, there is a lot of legal work that's being done by various NGOs that are funded by the uh, European Commission, by the EU, um, but that's not the sole source and I really don't know, okay? Um, your second question was, wait, wait, what was the second the question? The riots. The riots, okay, are the riots spontaneous? Are they spontaneous? No, so let's, there have been organized protests in Sheikh Jarrah for years. Um, and the protests are organized by all the usual suspects, right? They're organized by, um, uh, by small uh, Israeli organizations that are funded by the New Israel Fund. They're um, um, funded by uh, the European Union. And uh, they're in, some of them are organizations that are controlled by the uh, Palestinian Authority or by the PFLP. Um, they're the usual group and uh, they've had protests really since the beginning of this round of litigation um, uh, five or six years ago. Um, now, the, the protests turned violent, I think, at the instigation of the Palestinian Authority several months ago. Um, but at this point, it's already taken on a momentum of their own. So. The organized protests, you know, we know it's all the usual suspects who are uh, engaging in those protests, but the violence that they've turned into, the riots, the, at this point, it's no longer, the, the Palestinian Authority no longer has to light the, uh, spark the flame. It's already there. And so at this point, you can say that the, the riots are continuing spontaneously. But of course, they didn't arise spontaneously. Um, the Palestinian Authority quite explicitly played a role in instigating them months ago. And why no op-eds from top Israeli officials um, that, that um, would surely be published in major papers? Well, um, there's uh, um, uh, a variety of reasons. Um, some of this has to do with, you know, there's a, a, um, an Israeli uh, the Israeli political scene is difficult. Um, there's a lack of consensus on the right steps to do about anything. Um, and so uh, if you're asking, you know, 
why won't won't uh, um, let's say the foreign ministry do it? This is, is something that would require uh, uh, a dozen committees to meet a dozen times each before you'd get to anything that looks like a text that might be agreed upon. Um, that's one of the reasons. Um, um, but there's also, you know, I'm not I'm not sure that this is the right thing uh, um, for them to be doing. As you know, explaining is losing. To me, the question is not should right should the is, Israeli government explain the way um, uh, protected tenancy law works or the legal process works in Israel? Um, is there an audience for that? Is there somebody in among New York Times readers that is actually going to read that and say, oh, you know what? I guess Patrick Kingsley has been lying to me. I don't think that that's uh, the right thing. I think that the right thing to do is to uh, point out the anti-Semitism, the bigotry the, at the core of the protests. That's um, uh, a much harsher line to take. And quite frankly, there are all too many Israeli officials who are afraid to take that line because it requires them to call out for their anti-Semitism, um, a great many uh, officials in the European Union, in European states, and and in the United States and other allies, uh, you know, uh, particularly in the Democratic Party, who have endorsed this sort of thing and to call them out for their bigotry, and that's not an easy thing to do, and um, for, some people just don't have the courage. Yeah, but may I just say, Thank you it's very amazing that the Palestinian Authority, Abbas and others over the years, have bitterly attacked America, Trump and his officials, how bigoted they are, how anti-Palestinian they are. They have no problem attacking America. So why don't Israeli officials respectfully uh, explain you know, why uh, American officials uh, are saying something that's just ludicrous when it comes to the Sheikh Jarrah or other issues? The Arabs I, certainly do it. Uh, uh, actually, Morda, I... I this, I think, is, is more, than, more than anything else where you're important and the ZOA is important. I think that the, 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 the lead voices in attacking American officials for anti-Semitism have to be Americans. I, I, I think that um, um, it's easier for Americans to dismiss the voices of Israeli Jews, Israeli government officials, um, I think that it's, it's vital that um, American supporters of Israel point this out. They are the ones who have to, to press the claim. And so uh, I think that you know, what ZOA does, therefore, is invaluable. There's, there's no Israeli replacement for what you're doing. Thank you thank so you. much, Avi. With these words of uh, endorsement, we thank you uh, also for uh, uh, the, the whole talk, uh, as I said a few times already, it was incredibly well organized and clear and you took a very complicated subject and made it very understandable for everyone here. Uh, as everyone knows, we've been having these webinars ever since uh, the start of COVID and we plan on continuing to have it even as, uh, as we open up. We have an incredible program this Thursday, July 22nd at 7 p.m. It's in collaboration with the Iranian Americans for Liberty. Uh, the title of the program is Relations Between Israel, Iran, and the Arab Muslim World, Past, Present, and Future. And we'll have opening remarks by Morten Klein, uh, our ZOA national president. Uh, it will be moderated by Brian Lieb, and the, the special guest will be Dr. Hillel Newman uh, from the Israeli Consul, General, uh, the Israeli Consul General in Los Angeles. Uh, if you like this program, or if you want to support all of our programs, and as Avi said, all of our important work, and then we encourage you to go on uh, our website at zoa.org and, and to make a generous donation. Thanks again, Avi, and thanks everyone for coming to this program. Thank you all.